Let's uh, move on. Bill, Bill Ranksdale. Bill Ragsdale. I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay. Call me anything, just don't call me late for dinner. See. All right, are we all aboard? Working? Working fine. We see Very your good. screen. Thank we you. See your slide. I got it. Okay, off and running. All right. Honored to be presenting here with the Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group. Uh, brief bio was that I was one of the five founders of the Fourth Interest Group back in 1978. Uh, like a number of us, I was active for maybe 10 or 15 years and then faded away. And in the last year or so, came back again with great enthusiasm. So it's today, well, the way this started was in pondering through the case statement, I, I wondered, what would it look like if you wrote it in actual code? What would be a code expansion for the case statement? Now, most of the people that are aboard today are really very experienced and You've done this and much, much more, but you might find some of the inter internal techniques interesting. And uh, this is really a nice uh, intro on the case statement for uh, new programmers. So th the need for a case statement comes along when we need to do an N-way branch. If you're using if else then, that's fine if you've got to make a one or two decisions. But if you start making more than two decisions, the nesting if then else's get pretty clumsy. So for a structure of three or more branches, the case comes along. So as an example, I want to do a three-way branch having to do with measurement units, inches, feet, and yards. So I'd like a word that if I input one, it will give me a, a unit dimension of inches. If I input 12, it'll give me a label dimension of feet. And if I input 36, I'll get the unit supplied as yards. So in pseudocode, it's nested pseudocode, just like you would if then else. You input the number, you duplicate it, and compare it to one. If it's equal to one, you drop the save value and show interest. Otherwise, duplicate the save value, compare to 12. If that's equal, drop it and show feet. Otherwise, duplicate it and compare to 36. So you see the pattern here. There's a lot of duplicating, comparing, duplicating, comparing. Finally, at the very end, if no in, if the input does not match any of those numbers, you'll just uh, output a, a label that says no units. And then the then, then, then completes the entire structure. It's rather pretty when you do this on uh, D charts. You can see that it's a, it's a bunch of nested uh, if, else, thens. At the top left, we check for one. The next step down to the center right is 12. The next step down is 36. And very clearly, the units come out as inches, feet, yards, and no unit. So here's what the code would look like. This was this was my uh, my initial um, interest was what would the code look like for case if you didn't use case? Well, it's just the the uh, implementation implementation of that previous D chart, which says we have an input value. We also on the stack put one, the over duplicates, the equals checks to see if the value is equal. If so, we've saved that reference value and we drop it, or we've saved the input value, now we drop it, we output inches. And then the same thing happens. We compare to 12, compare to 36. So in each case, we have to duplicate that input value and then drop it if we use it. And finally at the end, at the very last, next to the last line, if none of this executes, we drop that input value and then give out no unit. So there we have case done with nested ifs. If you write that out, it's actually fairly clean because it's one um, element done on each line. Here's a test for it. Test, I always like to put the test code right in line with my programming. So I write a program, my test values are in line all the time. Every time I recompile a program, I recompile all of my tests. 
So in this case, we have one units, 12 units, 36 units, and the output becomes inches, feet, and yards. Now the case statement uh, does a similar process, selected between a, an arbitrary number of paths. And I was able to get online and catch the original reference. It's the Aker syntax, which is published in Fourth Dimensions in 1980. Uh, this was only our volume number two, which was roughly the second year of the fourth interest group. So the elements of the case, uh, the beginning and the end are pretty simple, and the middle is where the work is done. When you declare a case at the beginning, it marks the entrance point of the structure, and this is an instruction to the compiler on how to handle what follows. Then for each case, you have a number n and then of, if the stack value matches that end, then you drop them and do the execution. And then at end of, which is like the else, you jump clear to the end of the structure because you're done. If there's no match, you preserve the end and continue again after the end of. So at the end, each end of, if the execution has occurred, you go to end case, otherwise you try the next case. It is a sequential process. And so therefore you would want the most likely occurrence to be toward the beginning of the structure. Here's the D chart, which again is a rather pretty little D chart. We see at each branch, each fork branch is a decision. So the first decision is that of, and it has an input of one. So if we are inputting the number one, it's compared to one, the of does a comparison. If they match, it takes the left-hand path down to inches. If it does not match, it takes the right-hand path down. And then you see the 12 of in the center. That path possibly is taken. If not, down to the right to 36 of. And then finally, if none of the paths are taken, we have the not equal sign and we get no unit. And the end case is the final situation or the final termination point if there is no other execution. Otherwise, all those end ofs resume execution after end case. Simplifying the D chart. The original D chart shows the logic. Now, this is a little clearer. And uh, so we see that there are three choices at the beginning, the one of, 12 of, and 36 of. And remember, they're not done in parallel, as one might assume. They're actually done serially. And in the outputs, you have inches, feet, yards, and no units. So here it's done in case. And look how much cleaner and simpler this is. Oops, I see there's a mistake in the code. I left out the word case. So immediately after units, there should be the word case. Then one of makes a check for uh, input of uh, one, outputs inches, 12 will output feet, 36 will output yards, and uh, no units. The, the code to test that would be as just as we did before. We put in one units, 12 units, 36 units, and the output is inches, feet, and yards. So that's done with numbers, numbers in, numbers out. Remember those numbers could be addresses. Uh, they could be memory locations. Uh, they could be results of calculation. Uh, let's extend our interest in case. And now we're going to be uh, handling some text. In this case, we're looking at ASCII characters. So for a character, we input a number, which uh, would be an ASCII character, the, the uh, uh, decimal equivalent of an ASCII value. The case statement starts. Now, in Win32 fourth and most, the word ASCII is a smart word. If you are compiling, it will compile the following letter as a literal. If you are interpreting, it will place the, the numeric value of the following letter on the stack. So in this case, we're compiling. And therefore, at ASCII A, a literal value of A is compiled for a later comparison. For the input uh, letter, if it uh, if that input number does match the ASCII A, of will execute the following code of alpha. At end of, it jumps to after end case. So the ASCII input for A will give us alpha, the input D gives us delta, and the G for golf. And all of you hams will recognize this as the uh, uh, alpha uh, system that's used in uh, communication. Our tests, we do a character turn. Input the number 65 and do a character, 68 a character, 71 a character, 90 a character. 
The outputs are going to be alpha, delta, golf at match. And finally, the uh, 90, if I remember right, is, is uh, the value for Z, which is not given in the table. Therefore, we get a no match shown at the end. So let's do strings. Now it gets a little more compli complicated yet. Uh, the case statements really are doing comparison between numbers. Um, if you're handling strings, you have to make the string comparison uh, uh, separately and then feed that input into the case statement. The case statement is still good for the n-way branch. It just doesn't do the comparison. So in this case, we're going to have two strings. If they match, we want to return true, true, because that means the of portion of a case statement will execute. If the two strings do not match, we'll return false true, and that means that the of statement will not take place. And in both cases, we have to preserve the input string because it's used throughout the rest of the comparisons. So I developed the little string comparison word, s equal equal. s equal equal takes two string addresses. These are counted strings. So the address that is given is the count address. And that can be expanded to give the, the address uh, of the text and the count. So the input is two addresses. The output is address one preserved. And then a Boolean, which indicates a match or not match, and then true. So it's pretty simple code, amazingly dense. The um, over duplicates the address one, counts it. The wrote count duplicates address two, they're compared. If they're equal, you get a true and the, your, a true is forced. So if they match, you get a true true. If they do not match, you end up with a false true. The pseudocode for this is duplicate the input address and count it, get the reference address, count it, compare the strings, generate true true or false true. So here's an example of uh, uh, string comparisons. This is the pseudocode, which says we're going to input the address of a counted string, hopefully the name of a planet. It's going to be compared to the text Mercury. If it matches, we're going to put out 59,900,000 kilometers, the distance between Mercury and the sun. For Earth, we'll do the Earth distance to the sun. And if the string matches Mars, we'll output the uh, distance from Mars to the sun or from the sun to Mars. Here's the code for planets. Remember, we input the address of that counted, of that counted string that's uh, stored away externally. Begin the case statement. Now, C, C quote Mercury compiles a counted string in line. So on execution, we have the, count ad, the, ad, the address of the counted string coming in. And at the same time, we have the counted address of Mercury. The S equal equal compares them. Remember, it gives us either a true true or a false true. If you get a true true at of, the uh, dot quote will print the distance to the sun. And at this point, remember, we're going, we, uh, uh, we've, we have preserved that uh, address and we need to drop it. If the distance of the sun, uh, now part of the distance to the earth, if it matches, we get the distance to the earth printed or see Mar Mars the same. And finally, at the very end, the dot quote for no match. Now, there's a, um, um, a detail in case that at the end case, it expects a perimeter on the stack. So I put a one on that stack so it's happy and you don't have a uh, stack failure. So here's an example of, uh, of execution. This is interpreted. So with the, with the uh, dot paren, we're going to get the text Mercury is at. We then have the counted string for Mercury, and we pass that to the word planets. We'll repeat by Earth its counted string and planets. And finally, Mars, its counted string, Mars and planets. When these are interpreted, we will see the text Mercury at 57 million kilometers and so on. So you see, we've been able to handle strings with, uh, a, with a very small adjunct to the case statement that string equal equal. So our summary, case statements, very useful. If you have more than a two-way selection, 
whether you're doing numbers, ASCII values, or strings, case can work for you. The beauty of the case statement is it more clearly shows the program flow rather than this uh, uh, nested ifs and ends. Usually with nested ifs and ends, you need at least two lines of code for comparison. And if you indent, um, it can get fairly long. Remember we added the S equal equals was the extra word necessary to make the string comparisons work. This is posted at my GitHub page. So just go to GitHub, Bill Ragstail, and look for fourth projects. And also for all of you users of the Win32 fourth guide, um, at the same site, I have a 80-page uh, user's guide to Win32 fourth. So that wraps it up. Let's see if I can get out of this beast. And we're back in. Do we have any questions? Good. The clarity well, must the clarity I, must have been, clarity have, must have been wonderful. I have a question uh, on the string comparer. Were you just comparing the length of the string or comparing individual characters as well? The the compare word, which is C O M P A R E, in wordy two win win thirty two fourth. It requires four input parameters, and it does a full comparison letter by letter. It needs the, the letter count and the memory address of the first letter. So it runs that many characters straight through word by word by letter by letter by letter. If at the end you get a complete match, it yields the number zero. If one string is, quote, numerically larger than the other, you'll get a plus one, and if it's numerically smaller, you get a minus one. Generally, that means if one string is longer than another or shorter than another, you'll either get a plus one or a minus one. But the success case for an exact match is zero. And that's why in that um, code, just before the output, there's a zero equals, because the zero equals converts it to a true. All right, I yield the floor back to the Speaker of the House. Is there time for another question or no? Not a big sure. deal. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Quick. Um, I, I wasn't clear to me why we needed the drop after the of when you were doing a string comparison. What was the extra? It was S, uh, S equals equals or equals equals S rather was leaving something on the stack? Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to dodge that or defer that question because otherwise we're we're picking through code words debugging. Uh, the best thing would be go get the uh, uh, source code off of uh, GitHub and uh, you can you can analyze uh, uh, the, the structure from that, okay? Okay, and also one of your slides, you said that you were preserving in between the uh, of clauses and it seems like really what, what that does is it's preserving the top of stack because in is the, the it, it, just, just for sake of clarity, you were saying in of, and then you said preserve in between ofs, and I think it's actually preserve top of stack between ofs. Does that, does that make sense? Well, the, the in is the input parameter, and at the of, you can't, if you, you compare it, uh, at the of, you compare the input parameter to the given fixed parameter. Now, if they match, uh, if they, if at, upon the if they are always destroyed. Now the problem is if the if does not execute, um, you've lost your input parameter. So you have to duplicate yeah. the input parameter before, and then if the if the if path is taken, you've got to get rid of it. So this yeah, I, I mentioned all of that. The, the issue is that you've used the letter in both as the input parameter and as the as the designator on that slide for the thing that comes before the of. So it's confusing to say in is preserved between of cases. It's just it's just a matter of clarity, not not that I've misunderstood it. Ah, good. Okay, thanks so much. Back to Kevin. Thank you, Bill. Uh, that was a great experience, as always. Uh, Dr. Ting. <laughs>